Good evening, discerning viewers everywhere. Welcome along to Neil Oliver Live on GB News TV and on radio. Tonight, I'll be joined by six-term parliamentarian, freedom fighter and general man of the world, George Galloway. We'll discuss whether the UN is fit for purpose amongst much else. We'll also be asking whether the Pfizer vaccine should be given to women during any stage of pregnancy. And we'll be hearing from the music industry legend Pete Wasserman about his amazing collection of model trains. All of that, plus plenty of chat with my brilliant panellist, Andrew Eborn. But first, the news headlines with Aaron Armstrong. Hi there, very good evening to you. It is six o'clock. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. Passengers arriving at Dover for the Easter getaway have described being shell-shocked by the delays, with some groups waiting more than 16 hours. And several coachloads of adults and children have been there since last night. The port has declared a critical incident, and it has put the lengthy delays down to the French border processes and sheer volume. The cars have also been caught up in the gridlock, but the delays are less severe. The Labour leader, Kister Kirstarmer, says families trying to get on holiday will be frustrated yet again. I think the nature of the frustration will be not again. This is not the first time there have been problems at Dover. And the government needs to get a grip of this and plan ahead. We can't have every summer holiday, every Easter holiday, the same old problem. And so the government needs to get a grip of this and actually help people out who are just trying to get away for a few days holiday. A man accused of murdering a father and son in Cambridge has been remanded in custody. 66-year-old Stephen Alderton has appeared at Huntington Magistrates Court, charged with two counts of murder and possession of a firearm. Gary Dunmore and his son Josh were shot six miles apart on Wednesday and a hearing will take place in Cambridge Crown Court on Monday. The government says the rise in the national minimum wage proves they're doing what they can to help with the rising cost of living. Millions of the lowest paid workers will get a boost of 9.7% in their hourly wage from today. That takes it from £9.50 to £10.42. However, USDO, the shop workers union, say £12 per hour was their recommendation. Uh, that would have been the minimum requirement to help workers through the biggest cost of living crisis in 50 years. Around 5 million people will be able to get a spring COVID booster jab next week. A care home residents in England will be the first to receive the vaccine. That's from Monday. And all other eligible people, including those aged 75 and over, or those with a weakened immune system, will be able to book their jab online from Wednesday. Government plans that could see polluting water companies facing unlimited fines have been dismissed by opposition parties. There were, on average, more than 800 sewage spills per day into England's waterways in the last year. That is according to official figures. Ministers want to lift the current penalty cap of a quarter of a million pounds. However, Labour have described it as a flimsy regurgitation of old ideas. And the Lib Dems have again called for Therese Coffey, the Environment Secretary, to resign. Ukraine's foreign minister has uh, described Russia's presidency of the United Nations Security Council as the worst joke ever for April Fool's Day. Uh, Moscow has taken over the presidency of the UN's top security body. Uh, today, that's a role which rotates every month between the 15 permanent members. Well, the last time the Kremlin held a position was in February last year when it launched an invasion of Ukraine. Earlier, Russia said it plans to exercise all its rights in the role. At least 11 people have been killed after tornadoes swept through the south and midwest of the United States. A state of emergency has been declared in Arkansas and Missouri, where homes have been damaged and vehicles upended. Officials say more than 40 tornado reports were made across seven states on Friday night, with Illinois, Indiana, Alabama and Mississippi also impacted. TV Online, DAB, Plus Radio and on TuneIn. This is GV News. Now... It's over to Neil. I have a confession to make. Some of the confession is already out there, having dripped through what I've said on here over the weeks and months just past. But I should be more frank. 
For most of my life, I was unaware and therefore silent about so much that's wrong. Events unfolded and I was too busy in my own little world. I missed what was happening for much too long, but not knowing is not enough. Ignorance is no defense. Just the other day, someone mentioned The West Wing, the US drama series about the fictionalized goings on in the White House. I watched episodes of that show more than once over the years. We have the box set. Now I can't look at it at all, and I doubt if I will ever look at it again. Sounds like a silly detail in the scheme of things, but the West Wing is one of many trivialities I can no longer bear because each is a reminder of a bigger problem. The West Wing belongs to that time when I took it for granted, just as a for instance, that a Democrat White House meant the good guys. But that was then, and this is now. It's not just the West Wing, of course. There are whole piles of movies and TV shows I can't look at now because the sight and sound of them makes me cringe with the memory of my naivety and my downright dumbness during the years when I enjoyed them. Admitting naivety and dumbness is a damned hard bullet to chew. So much of what's wrong in the world is moving faster and faster. But all those neoliberal stooges in their tiny, tiny suits with their good hair and hundred grand wristwatches, the ones that all went to the same sort of schools and belonged to the same sort of private clubs that were mentored by the same elderly ghouls and so have the same connections to the same transnational entities and corporations. All those identical placemen and women pretending to care about equality and diversity while focused only and always on playing their parts in securing yet more wealth and power for others like themselves. All of them are running scared now and for good reason. The internet helped them enormously. Indeed, the grab for power and mountains of cash during the past three years would not have been possible without it. But the internet is a double-edged sword and double-edged swords are sharp on both sides. Never before have so many of us had access to so much information about all that's going on. Those neoliberals, those neo-feudalists like to brand everything that doesn't help their cause as misinformation. But they would say that, wouldn't they? More and more of us have rumbled them though those proto-tyrants and many dictators and they know it and it's already too late for them to put the genie back in the lamp and so all they can do is take more and more liberties, pass more and more legislation to let them build the walls they hope will protect them, protect them from us. It's like a supermarket sweep as they hurtle up and down the aisles desperately piling anything and everything into their trolleys before their time runs out. And so Emmanuel Macron slips his luxury watch off of his wrist and into his trouser pocket on live TV while he thinks no one's looking. And after making it illegal to film and share footage of the French police in action as they beat French people with batons and spray tear gas into their faces, the mainstream media there, here and elsewhere pushes the line that the French peasants are revolting in the face of changes to the pensionable age. What arrant nonsense. This latest unrest in France, this revolution, is hardly about pensions. Have you seen the age of the protesters? Twenty-somethings who surely care not a jot about what pensions they may or may not receive in four decades' time. This is the continuing war by the yellow vests, those regular people sick and tired of everything Macron stands for, who see through his hollow cant about egality and diversity all the way to the heart of what's really going on which is to say a desperate last dash for the power to crush and silence dissent. No wonder he had to cancel the visit by King Charles. To lose one king off with his head is unfortunate. To lose two would be downright careless. Here in the UK, we're careering through the cost of lockdown crisis led by Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, a man richer than that king, a veritable poster boy for the hedge fund class with all his ties to big money and bigger business, a man who cheers on digital currency a man whose father-in-law owns Infosys, a company behind all the tech necessary for central bank digital currencies, digital IDs and a social credit system. In the US, where former President Donald Trump has been indicted, President Joe Biden's administration desperately goads 100 million Americans, going to any lengths it would seem to provoke some or other insurrection that will justify further draconian crackdowns on opposition. When the might of the US state is focusing so much effort on coming up with a reason to arrest a focal point of that opposition, a person really does have to wonder about the state of democracy and justice in the so-called land of the free. Former Speaker Nancy Pelosi said on social media last week that Donald Trump was entitled to a trial and I quote, to prove innocence. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the last time I looked, a person living in a democracy was presumed innocent until proven guilty. I believe a faux pas like Pelosi's is described as saying the quiet part out loud. 
maybe she should extend the same entitlement to Joe Biden and his family and have them prove they're innocent of dodgy dealings in Ukraine and China and elsewhere. What's sauce for the goose, after all? And if there's a walking metaphor for the moral and cognitive decline of the West, then surely it's Joe Biden shuffling from podium to podium, plainly wondering where he is and why. As if we needed more proof the powers that be have lost their way, that they are without any moral compass, whatever. There it is in the evident dementia of the 46th President of the United States of America. US Vice President Kamala Harris has been in Africa on what they call a charm offensive. Alarmed by the growing influence on that continent of other powers, she's there to talk to Africans about the importance of democracy. Since she represents a US that has toppled multiple governments in Africa over the years, this takes some chutzpah or perhaps just unmitigated temerity and unparalleled gall. In Canada, the strutting popinjay that is Justin Trudeau awarded himself emergency powers to crush the truckers' protest. Remember the truckers' protest, including freezing and seizing the bank accounts of the truckers and those supporting their efforts. But the truckers are still there, just as the farmers and their tractors are still on the roads in the Netherlands. And those yellow vests are still out and about in France. And the people of Israel, those same people explicitly used as the laboratory of the world during the pandemic, are out on the streets of Tel Aviv and elsewhere. I said the internet was a double-edged sword, and I meant it. More and more people are talking about and worried about AI, artificial intelligence, and rightly so. No doubt chat, GPT, and the rest of whatever tech is coming down the line will put even more people out of a job. Many predict an existential threat for the species, and maybe they're right. Sometimes, though, I think AI is just the same old, same old, made unimaginably fast and voracious, drawing upon everything our species has learned so far and repurposing it, reflecting back at us in a fraction of a femtosecond, the distillation of what it took our ancestors millennia to learn. And then sometimes I wonder if fast is all it is. I was beaten out of arithmetic by the first calculator I encountered 50 years ago. Computers are faster than me at everything under the sun. And I'm still here. Like the rest of us, AI is living inside the body of a whale. There's plenty for it to eat for now, but only because there was a whale. At the same time, good old Homo sapiens Mark I is stubbornly continuing to evolve, the better to adapt to its niche. Don't stop yourself celebrating stubborn and resourceful Homo sapiens wherever you find him or her. Here in the UK, in the United States, in France, in the Netherlands, in Germany, in Africa, in the Middle East, everywhere. Between 1811 and 1816, skilled tradesmen rose in rebellion here in the UK to protest the loss of their livelihoods to machines. Weavers took to smashing looms that put them out of a job. Those rebels are remembered as Luddites. In 1812, the Tory Prime Minister Spencer Percival made frame-breaking a crime punishable by death. Lord Byron spoke against the move. It was his maiden speech in the Lords, and he used it to lament how a once loyal and industrious body of the people had become miserable men driven by nothing but want. You may, rec you may call the people a mob, he said, but do not forget that a mob often speaks the sentiments of the people. Neoliberal stooges with the right connections pretending to care about the people but only focused on securing more wealth and power for others like themselves are as nothing in the face of those who have right on their side. I was blind to what was going on for most of my life. I admit as much freely now, but it seems to me it matters to say so. If the world around you just feels wrong at the moment, if it makes you uncomfortable in your skin, it's not because you're going mad, but because you know the difference between right and wrong, and so much is so wrong. It's absolutely not the job of governments and leaders to make so many people so unhappy, so frightened of the future. It's utterly wrong that meaningful influence is in the process of being ceded to transnational bodies comprised of unelected, unaccountable placemen and women, the World Health Organization, the World Economic Forum. It's time to assess whether they're fit for purpose, NATO, the United Nations and the rest. Any and all groups can and do go wrong, and when they do, it's the responsibility of everyone to say so and to do something about it. The internet is a double-edged sword and cuts both ways. The rich and powerful plainly do not understand the new tech of social media, failed to see it would empower not just them, but all of us as well. American comedian George Carlin looked at those in power in his own country and said, it's a big club and you ain't in it. It might be a big club in terms of power and money, but its members are few in number. We are many and we are right while they are wrong and in the wrong. We know it 
And deep down, they know it too. Well, if that's my opinion, of course it is, and you are free to disagree. Keep your tweets and emails coming all through the show. You can email gbviews at gbnews.uk. You can tweet me as well, at gbnews, and I'll try to get to some of your comments later in the show if time allows. Joining me tonight, the broadcaster and lawyer, Andrew Eborn. Good to see you, Andrew. It's lovely to see you again. Flying solo on that couch. Oh, I, I feel sort of empty here. There's <laughs> nothing but spaceman, as Sam would say. What I was talking about there, what's going on in America, what do you make of this I, I dogged pursuit of Trump? And it's extraordinary. We're, this is happening on April Fool's Day, um, but no amount of made-up pranks could compete with the stuff that we're seeing in the news every single day. Um, and you're right, we're drowning in a sea of information, most of which is false, and I think you have to question everything. Um, even, I mean, Ofcom require us to put balance in there so you can sort of turn around and say, well, Macron, for example, his side of the story for that was he was sort of bouncing his watch, he needed to take it off so he didn't clunk on the desk, is what he would say. Did he so, know? That's exactly what he said, <laughs> absolutely. So none of this Man Marie Antoinette to let them eat cake. It was uh, that sort of moment, which is why he hid this multi-zillion dollar watch. Uh, but America is quite extraordinary. Uh, for the first time in history, um, a president has been arrested. And the narrative is quite extraordinary. I was half expecting to see a picture, the, the, the money shot with, with Trump in, in, you know, in handcuffs and things like that. But he's done a deal whereby that's not going to happen. He will, however, be fingerprinted and have the, uh, the mug shot and so on and so forth. But it's playing into his hands because this first case about uh, payments to Stormy oh. Daniels um, was basically it's probably the weakest of the cases against him because you've got the whole issue about the January 6th riots and so on and so forth. There's all sorts of allegations and it's not quite clear what the charges what did, are yet. What did you make of Nancy Pelosi's form of words to prove innocence? I mean, how could, she po how could someone in her position possibly get that wrong in that way at that time. I, I, I find it extraordinary. You're, you're absolutely bang on the money on that. If ever there was a case of showing what you're thinking, uh, that, that was that phrase. No, absolutely. Nobody has to prove anything. If you're charged with something, it's up for, to the prosecution to prove so that the uh, uh, people are sure that the person did it. You don't have to prove anything. And the, the form of language, what's happened is Trump's popularity, as a result, has soared with his supporters. He predicted last week that if I get charged and arrested, everybody will rise up in my favour. And that's exactly what's happening. It's so dangerous, though, I think, for, an, for a, 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 an administration to be so blatantly seeking to provoke so many people to do goodness knows what right. as a, so that there can then be a response. Well, you're absolutely that, right. That is monstrously irresponsible. But, and it's also naive. I mean, talk about naivety. You turn around and say, if you do this, it's very predictable what's going to happen. All you're going to do, you're not going to turn people off Trump. The people who are supporters of Trump will continue supporting him. He's always said he's the victim. It's all political. And all this is, is playing into his hands on that one. Yeah. We've got a, great, a break upon us, uh, after which we will be joined by the inimitable George Galloway to discuss whether the United Nations is are still fit for purpose. See you in a few minutes. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. Oh, the situation... Uh, oh, no, sorry. L last week, there were stories about Russia running so short of ammunition for its war in Ukraine it was seeking to buy from Korea. On the other hand, there were reports that the city of Bakhmut was in imminent danger of falling to Russian forces and that Ukrainian forces were about to be destroyed. Very hard to get a handle on what's going on. At the same time, there's talk of the geopolitical tectonic plates shifting under our feet uh, and the emergence of a new multipolar world. But we're going to come to that story later in the show. I think there are some technical difficulties getting hold of George. Now... Each time my wife was pregnant with our children, three of them, she was instructed to be ultra careful about anything she put into her body. Soft cheese was out, I remember. She stayed away from all medicines, even over-the-counter painkillers. And so when the brand new products offered as vaccines against COVID appeared, it seemed inconceivable to me that they would be pushed on pregnant women. And yet they were. They were also pushed on babies from six months old. I'm joined next this evening by Dr Jim Thorpe. He's an obstetrician and gynaecologist of 44 years standing. 
specialising in maternal and fetal medicine. And I'm also joined, first of all, by Dr. Roland Salmon, consultant epidemiologist specialising in communicable diseases. Uh, good evening, Roland. Are you there? Hello, Dr. Salmon. Are you with me? There you are. Uh, yes, can you hear me? I can hear you. And I'm struggling to hear Dr. Salmon. Is there any way that I can increase the volume on the good doctor? Oh. Dr. Salmon, what it's, justification uh, was there? microphone. For, that's okay, that, I've got you now. What justification was there for giving a new product like these vaccines with no long-term safety testing to pregnant women and thereby to the babies inside them? Well, there was a lot of good evidence that uh, pregnant women who got COVID had a much worse outcome than uh, otherwise healthy women of the same age. They were about twice as likely to end up in intensive care twice as likely to be ventilated and about three times as likely to die. So it was quite reasonable, I believe, to regard them as therefore being in a risk group. Now, you're quite right. In many ways, it's not ideal to have to use a completely novel vaccine. But I think in this occasion, the risks probably merited it. There's been considerable follow up of the use of, uh, of, vac of this vaccine, not least in the United Kingdom and not least by the UK Health Security Agency, which is not always a body that I would necessarily invoke, but I think they've done well here. And they've followed up nearly a million pregnant women and some 300,000 of which have, uh, have plus of which have been vaccinated. And what they find is that rates of prematurity, stillbirth and what's called like for dates or in the modern parlance, small for gestational age is lower and often significantly lower in the groups that have been vaccinated. So although I'm very sceptical like you are, Neil, about the use of uh, the vaccine in healthy adults and younger people, I do think there's a very reasonable case for regarding pregnant women as an at-risk group. And for them, there is a case for using the vaccine. But why, as I said in the, in the introduction to the topic, it has always been the case, hasn't it, in the case of obstetrics, uh, in the case of the way that obstetricians and, and midwives handle a pregnant women, that it's all a risk benefit analysis, isn't it? You know, that why would you necessarily intervene with this woman at all? Up to and including a, a great deal of caution around, you know, everyday medicines and everyday foodstuffs. Why in that context was it ever contemplated that you would put no novel products, largely untested, into pregnant women? It's just not done, or it wasn't previously. Well, uh... I think the simple answer to that is because the risk was that much higher and there was a means of preventing it, so it was used. Now, you might reasonably say to me that we don't know what the longer term consequences of this might be, nor could we have done. On the other hand, there were some immediate problems that needed to be addressed and were addressed by doing this. I think that's a reasonable decision to have been made. And I think we have to be a little bit careful that we might find ourselves here deterring people who would benefit from this from actually coming forward and getting it. One of the, and not to mention the spill off into uh, other vaccine preventable diseases. I think one of the problems, this whole furore around COVID vaccination, some of which, as I say, I, I think is entirely justified, has had is it's undermined what was previously a relatively transparent means of recommending vaccine in the United Kingdom. And one that actually for very good reasons, was largely trusted. And I, I think that's actually extremely unfortunate. The latest booster is shortly to be on offer. I, I presume you approve, even, even in the face of so much in the way of reporting of adverse effects, life-changing effects and deaths, would you still be in that context in favour of this large-scale vaccination? I mean, my understanding of the recommendations for boosters thus far is that they are being concentrated, at least at this point in time, on those people who are at measurably much higher risk, the very elderly, and particularly those living in, in, uh, in uh, institutional care, and those people with intercurrent illnesses that make them particularly vulnerable. And I think that's perfectly reasonable. I have always thought the extension of the vaccination to certainly under 30s, and particularly the under 16s, who aren't in a position very readily to make a decision for themselves was foolish. And one of the low points for me in the, among several in the whole uh, COVID story was when the uh, four chief medical officers decided to get together to overrule the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunization, 
when they had said, no, we shouldn't be vaccinating uh, 12 to 16 year olds. That seemed to me to essentially undermine the position of professional advice and look suspiciously like uh, they'd been leaned on by the special advisors and the administrative civil servants to uh, give a get out of jail free card to the politicians who are getting pressure from different areas. If the politicians want to do things like that, I think realistically you accept that that's what will happen, but at least let them make the political case and take the responsibility for it. We're having problems connecting to uh, Dr. Jim Thorpe in Florida. Um, Andrew Eborn, you've been listening to that, what uh, Dr. Salmon is saying. After all that we've heard, after all the justifiable uh, concern around these products that are pushed as vaccines, what is your reaction? Yeah. Just as a, as a reasonable man to this ongoing insistence on the use of I, them. I, I have a real problem with this whole situation. And I'll tell you why. Is that everybody but everybody has become an expert. Everybody's become a virologist. Everybody's got medical knowledge. Uh, the difficulty that we have is that the experts don't agree. And, you, you, and the danger is, is when you talk out against it, you get shut down or you get fines and so on and so forth. Um, to be clear, and I've been handed all sorts of information about things are false and everything else, the NHS at the moment, they're saying that vaccines are both safe and strongly recommended. I've got, I've got my man in Florida, go for it. Andrew Ebon, if you, if you bear with me. Uh, Dr Jim Thorpe, are you there finally after much effort? Thank Jim, you. hello. Jim, I don't necessarily have too much time with you. Tell me, what was your reaction when you realised that these products sold as vaccines were to be given to pregnant women? Are you directing that question to me, Sean? I am, Dr. Thorpe, yes. Yes. Uh, well, this is unprecedented in the history of medicine. Never ever have we uh, rolled out a um, experimental gene treatment and never had it tested and roll it out globally in pregnancy. Uh, this is breaking the sacrosanct golden rule of pregnancy. This is uh, unpre unprecedented. This is the most egregious violation of medical ethics in the history of the world. And this was a fait accompli. There was no safety data. In fact, there was very damning data, which the US government was aware of, and the whole world should have been aware of on February 28th, 2021. It was a lethal drug. It was the most lethal drug or medicine ever rolled out in the history of medicine, according to Pfizer's own data, it was killing 100 people a week for the first 12 weeks of rollout. On page seven of the Pfizer 5.3.6 post-marketing data, everybody had that. The government has it. What did you see happening, Dr. Thorpe? You know, you're, you've 44 years, you've been in the field of obstetrics and gynaecology, working in the fields of, you know, uh, maternal and fetal medicine. What did you see? You witnessed the rollout of this, uh, this product. It's a bloody disaster. I, I've seen almost 26,000 patients in the last, high risk OB patients in the last four years, three to four years. It's been a bloody disaster. Uh, shortly after the rollout, there was a massive increase in very, very severe menstrual abnormalities during pregnancy uh, after the vaccine was rolled out. Um, there was a massive increase in pregnancy complications. And this was not related to COVID-19 because these didn't happen in 2020. Are you able to put numbers on it? Can you, can you, can you give proportions you know, compared to the world of before and the, and the world after the rollout began? I can, and um, uh, we just published uh, peer-reviewed, uh, the most important uh, work in publication uh, of my career, and I've had uh, over two, well over 200. So what we did was we took the FDA and CDC, the governmental data, and as per the CDC and the FDA, we did it exactly as per their biased recommendations, which is comparing a novel vaccine with that of a established vaccine. And that's cheating because it's not really a placebo. And even the well-established vaccines has uh, injury and death associated with it. So we, we, we used uh, exactly their protocol um, and we hung them with their own rope, so to speak. So we used the influenza vaccine, which was in the United States of America, which was 
recommended uh, and approved for the use of pregnancy in late 1997. So our study began 1998, January 1st, continued until June 30th, 2022, 282 months of uh, influenza vaccine uh, in pregnancy experience. Compare that with the novel vaccine COVID-19, uh, only 18 months of treatment. And what we, the CDC and the FDA, uses a risk ratio of twofold as their danger signal. And again, this is the government data. This is not Jim Thorpe's data or Peter McCullough's data. So this is the government data. We didn't see a twofold increase. We saw such massive increases that we had to convert the x axis to a logarithmic axis. So we saw, for example, almost a 1,200-fold increase in severe menstrual abnormalities, a 57-fold increase in miscarriage, a 38-fold increase in fetal death. And I have 15 other major pregnancy complications that were far exceeded the CDC and the FDA signals, including Bear with me, bear with me, Dr. Thorpe. Dr. Salmon, how do you respond? How do you react to hearing figures like that? That, that kind of fault, that kind of orders of magnitude of increase in, in very troubling consequences? Well, I mean, I have read Dr. Thorpe's paper, which is uh, helpfully available as a preprint. Um, I'd have to say there are eight or nine other peer reviewed papers that don't find the same thing from another other, number of other countries in the world Canada, Israel, the United Kingdom, the US. I think the central problem I have with Dr. Thorpe's paper is it seems very unlikely to me that the reporting rate for influenza complications is anything like the reporting rate for COVID complications. Why do I say that? Because the American reporting system is a passive surveillance system. And one thing that we know about that is that it, those are actually driven by the amount of uh, coverage that is occurring in things like the news media. So it's very likely that much higher levels of COVID complications were reported. There's also, I think, the number of um, influenza vaccinations that are being proposed, which I think is actually a CDC estimate, seems to me unusually high, certainly if you were to relate the UK experience to the US. And there are also, I mean, I think Dr. Thorpe actually says, he's a, I mean, I recognize and respect his experience that he went through these case reports himself. I don't see him mentioning having used any preset case definitions for what he's looking at. And the problem with that is that, though I don't doubt for a moment his um, integrity and enthusiasm when he approached that task, if you don't set yourself some criteria, it's very easy to fall into so the trap I of... To, uh, I have to, I have to give That's that... That's why uh, clinical trials, for example, are always... Uh, Blinded. I have to give that. I have to give that point to. I have to give that point to Dr. Thorpe to let him respond to that. Dr. Thorpe, what how do you? Hold on, Dr. Salmon. Hold on. Hold on, Dr. Salmon. Dr. Thorpe, how do you feel about having the 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 premise of your of your paper contradicted in that way or challenged? Uh, oh, I'm, I'm always excited to be challenged, but I think that we we have the. Um, cart before the horse here. But what we've done is we have absolute for certain data from Pfizer's internal documents that is validated. Nobody can question those. So um, the rollout of this dangerous gene therapy in pregnancy, with, there was never any data. The only data they had was death and danger and injuries data straight from the company. So now the rollout in pregnancy was a fait accompli. Uh, the Shima Bakura New England Journal of Medicine article was a complete fraudulent, manipulated data that pushed the vaccine throughout the entire world. So you can't go back the fake uh, medical military industrial complex that changes all their journals. They can publish a lot of uh, uh, 10 to 15 studies now of pure trash and manipulated data that is biased because they're owned by the pharmaceutical companies. Stay with and me, gentlemen, true. both gentlemen, if you would stay with me. I'm going to have to go to a break, but I'd like you to stay with me and we'll pick this discussion up again after, after the break. Don't go away. Welcome back, everyone, to Neil Oliver Live. We're in the middle of a discussion here with Dr. Jim Thorpe and Dr. Roland Salmon about the impact of the uh, products pushed as vaccines 
on pregnant women and babies. Uh, Dr Thorpe, I think you're still with me. I'm happy to see that. Is there any way of knowing, seeing uh, what the implications might be for the babies who were born to women who took these products? Are we seeing that yet? Yes. Yes. Yes, it's, uh, it's, it's very concerning, uh, very, very concerning outcomes. The fertility rates are dramatically decreased. The uh, pregnancy loss rate is dramatically increased. There's an increase of premature delivery, and there is a massive increase in premature admit deliveries, babies admitted to the ICU. I want to make it really clear that 1,223 dead people after the vaccine in the first 90 days of rollout on page seven of Pfizer's own internal document. And then on page 12, the catastrophic pregnancy outcomes from Pfizer's own data is unacceptable. You can't write this ship no matter how many tainted, biased, uh, fake fraudulent studies you publish in the medical industrial complex captured journals. D Dr. Salmon, very strong words from Dr. Thorpe there, uh, but it does seem hard to challenge the, the, the data that's in Pfizer's own data that after all they did try to withhold for 55 or 75 years or whatever it was and which was only finally released after court action. Yeah, I'm not going to sit here to be an apologist for the uh, pharmaceutical industry, certainly. But, you know, the UK Health Security Agency has diligently followed up pregnancies in England, those who have been vaccinated and not been vaccinated, and demonstrated a benefit. I personally don't believe them to be in the pay of the military industrial complex, though uh, Dr. Thorpe may, uh, may, I guess, think differently about that. And my question to him would be, given that what we know and I don't think this is in dispute about the outcomes when women are, pregnant women are infected with COVID and the elevated risks they run of stillbirth, of maternal death, of prematurity. Do you not think something ought to be done to mitigate that risk? And if you're not proposing to vaccinate them, what are you proposing to do? Well, Dr. Sarn, thank you very much. I, I really, really appreciate your, um, your collegial um, interaction here. I, I really appreciate you and I really respect you and honor you for coming on. Um, I think that you, you have a little bit of misperception here. I'm an expert. I'm a maternal fetal medicine specialist. Um, th there's a wrong connotation. Pregnancy does not increase the risk. I have absolutely incontrovertible data um, that, for example, f uh, fetal death was not increased in 2020. It didn't start until after the vaccine rollout. I have whistleblower data from all over the world, and I can I can assure you that pregnant women are not at risk for COVID-19. In fact, their risk is mitigated, and the best study was performed by a maternal fetal medicine specialist at University of Texas, Houston, and recently published with the largest uh, series ever in the world on COVID-19 and pregnancy, and what Beth Pinellas found was that the risk of a pregnant woman dying was markedly less than a non-pregnant woman. And then furthermore, um, Dr. Simon, it was a completely, um, again, I totally respect you. This is not aimed at you. Um, this is aimed at the medical industrial complex. It is completely fraudulent. It was never necessary. It was never safe. And it was never effective in pregnancy. I've been using hydroxychloroquine in pregnancy for 44 years. And so has every other physician in the United States of America. And uh, the CDC and the FDA have previously published on their website just how safe and effective it was in pregnancy um, for, for autoimmune disease and, and in children. So um, listen, the science is in. Uh, there was, it was never indicated really for any population because we have massive numbers of safe and effective treatment with early outpatient therapy. Over 99% successful treatment. Over 300,000 patients have been treated by myfreedoctor.com with a cure rate of 99.99% only six deaths out of those 300,000. The science is in, the vaccine was never necessary, and it sure as hell was never necessary in pregnancy. 
Dr. Salmon, do you do you feel at all, listening to Dr. Thought, do you feel at all that the information that you've, uh, you know, been invited to trust was not trustworthy, that you were reading in good actually, faith? Actually, I don't, and I hope this isn't just me being obstinate, but there's a process by which uh, we come to accept uh, medical information, and that's the process of uh, clinical studies and peer reviews. And I'm both a clinical doctor, though admittedly some years retired now, as well as a medical epidemiologist. And the nine or 10 studies and their subsequent meta-analyses that have come through that process actually fundamentally disagree with what Dr. Thorpe is saying. Now, I accept that uh, there may be other studies out there that, that contradict this. That's generally the way with science, but it seems to me those people and from you know, reputable academic institutions who've taken the trouble to synthesize it in the way that I would know and recognize don't come to the some, same conclusion as him. Uh, so unless I'm going to radically change my frame of reference rather suddenly, for the time being, as I say, much as I appreciate his courtesy and his approach, I'm not going to agree with him either. A last word to you, Dr. Thorpe, before I have to cut this. Yes, so uh, I, I certainly respect uh, collegial dialogue, but I can tell you that uh, there's well over 30 other completely independent sources globally that completely corroborate our data. You cannot come in with fake science after the fact, after they've committed the sin of what they've done and try to legitimize it. You can't do that. Uh, there's, uh, listen, all the, all the other sources in the world, the UK Yellow Card, the uh, European Medical Agency's UDRA Vigilance, the WHO, uh, uh, VG Access, all of these show the exact same thing that our government data shows. Dr. And you Thor can't write this huge mistake by publishing false uh, manipulated data. The V-safe data system in the United States of America is being hidden from our people. Uh, it's over 10 million people. And 7% of all the population that got the vaccine required a hospital visit or a doctor visit. And another 25% missed work or missed school. That is 33% of all comers that take the vaccine had significant complications. This is unacceptable. It's a sham. And the United States government is uh, corrupted, and they're not giving this information to the American people. Doctors, doctors both, thank you very much for your very polite, polite and courteous uh, debate this evening. Uh, Dr. Jim Thorpe in, in Florida and Dr. Roland Salmon, thank you very much for your time. Coming up, I'll get to talk about a hobby. <sighs> Miniature Railways. See you in a couple of minutes. Channel. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. As God is my judge, I will have a conversation with George Galloway at some point, but not this week. That's to be, that's to be rearranged. OK, we've not yet run out of steam, though, uh, and we're on our train event. New TV series Hornby. Uh, model World has been taking viewers behind the scenes of the world of model railways for the past eight weeks, finding out the fascination behind the fixation of some of the UK's biggest model train collectors. Some of the most enthusiastic model collectors are also well-known celebrities, with Pete Waterman starring alongside his prized model collections in the final two episodes of the current series. Let's take a look at him and it in action. OK, there we are. There's the man himself, uh, busily at work recreating reality uh, in, uh, in, that, uh, in that space. Uh, he joins me to tell us all about it now. Good evening, Pete. Good evening, Neil. How are you? I'm very well, thanks, Pete. Good to see your face. How did Thank your you. interest in this particular pursuit, this hobby, this pastime begin? 1948. I had my first train set and I've never not had one ever since. Is it just a, a case of, of of buying and assembling and putting it together, or 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 do you or do you get deeper into the process than that given time? Oh no, I, I, we build everything. I mean, other than the actual Hornby engines. I mean, uh, for me, it's not collecting; it's about building and researching and getting it absolutely perfect. And what you saw there in that clip was my workshop. And every year we build a giant railway. The Chester Cathedral for 
the school holidays for, for people to come and play with it. And that's what it's all about. I mean, it's like get people to enjoy playing with it. That don't touch, you know, it's taken us 100 years to build it. It's, that's not what it's about. Come in, have some fun, enjoy. It, it, strikes, me, it strikes me, Pete, that it's, uh, it's surely a completely different experience to be with something real where the generations coming through at the moment experience everything on a screen. Whereas to be in a space, yes. as you're describing, yes. with actual equipment that actually moves is altogether different. Yes. Yeah, so what we do, Dale, is we give them a tablet. So the tablet is their technical side, if you like, and they can drive the real trains. And the kids just take to that straight away because they instantly know what to do with a, a mobile phone or, or a tablet. Um, and you can see that they, the joy, enjoyment they get from that, actually seeing something move in front of them and being able to walk around. And, of course, being kids, you know, the first thing they do is they open the throttle as fast as it can go, and they want it to do 290 miles an hour. That's all they care. They just want to see it crack. Uh, Andrew, are you, are you um, reassured by, the, by, by Pete's testimony that there's still children coming through I, who, given this opportunity, will grab it with oh, both hands? I, I love it. I love the idea of getting people's faces out of screens. And, and I, I know Pete is a, a fanatic about this sort of stuff. I, I mean, I, he even named, uh, I think, a boring machine uh, for a literally boring machine for the high-speed railway. Dorothy, I'm not quite sure what you had against Dorothy, Pete. Correct. What's that? So she was a, a, she was a scientist from Coventry which is uh, why they named it Dorothy. Is it a social if, if, uh, activity, Pete? Because I'm sure a lot of people imagine that it's, it's people who are quite um, introvert away in attics and basements you know, pursuing this kind of activity. Or is there a community, a, a, a lively community? Oh, it's, uh, Neil, it's about, it's about community. I mean, one of the things that technology has done is allowed people to build model railways and work them totally you know, on technology and not even go into the room to play with them. And I say, why? Why? That's not the point. The point is you're with your mates and you're having a crack. You're enjoying yourself. You're having fun. You're, you know, you're giving each other information. Pete, it's, it's, Pete, it's lovely stuff. Pete, lovely stuff. Lovely to see you. Great to hear about that. Something real in an artificial world. Uh, my thanks to Andrew Ebon for joining me today. It's my Easter breaks. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. 